Welcome back to SurgeCast, the vodcast that inspires creators to be better creators. Thank you for joining me, everybody. Uh, if you're new here, consider subscribing and following the show. On today's show, we have an icon in the podcasting world, and I feel honored he carved out some time to sit down with me. This man has been in the podcasting game since the early 2000s. That's right, the 2000s. Probably even earlier. Uh, he's worked for Podbean, Libsyn, Spreaker, and so many other podcasting companies, but currently, he's a content creator partner with StreamYard. Today, we're talking to Robert Greenlee. We talk about his career, what podcasting was like in the 2000s, and the evolution of the medium with Podcasting 2.0. I was so stoked for this interview and I'm super excited to show you. So let's get into it. Oh man. Thank you very much for uh, doing the show today. I really appreciate your time, man. Like, yeah, well, thanks for the invite. Well, Great. No, I mean like you are like, <laughs> you are like one of the OGs, like uh, one of the original guys in the podcasting world, you know? So it's kind of like, I I'm yeah. just. I'm been just around it a long time. You're yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just like I'm blessed to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean it's fun. I enjoy. I've been I've been doing this kind of stuff since 1999, so it's been been quite a ride. So it's almost been 25 years for me now. That's or about amazing. 25 years. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Not doing just podcasting. That was really right. Just, <laughs> came later. <laughs> yeah. That came later. Um, so it's been. It's been close to 20 years now though. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, man, seriously, thank you very much for uh coming on my little show yeah. here. Uh oh, it's, <laughs> I want to be supportive of of as many content creators as I can. So that's that's kind of my mission. Awesome. I uh just out of curiosity, what's your what are you doing at StreamYard right now? What are you what are you I'm I'm really a content creator partner of theirs. So I'm okay. actually um, creating a weekly live program for them every Thursday evening on the East Coast. Okay. So, but it's it's live and YouTube and LinkedIn and and X and mm -hmm. and all those platforms and and okay. it's really a live kind of conversational program that I do uh, that brings in audience into participating and then uh, you know I usually have like a guest with love me it. in the program not like we're doing right here right so, right yeah. yeah love it okay and it's on Streamyard, so it's it's using all the same tools that you are so yeah, yeah. <laughs> i thought this was perfect you know Be, because it, it's funny because like everything uh all the platforms i use like Podmatch and um mm -hmm. whatever scheduling programs i, I use you know it, everything yep. goes to zoom and i'm like no i want to use Streamyard. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah so you know i i really you know it, it's kind of i think a hindrance because i want to use Streamyard, and you know i want that to be an option you know like in uh in the scheduling yeah. platforms so yeah it should be it's it hasn't had the integration that i think a lot of the other bigger platforms have accomplished like zoom right but right, right. but it's certainly a big platform there's actually a lot of people using it it's now owned by a new company i don't know if you knew that out of out of the country of italy so it's actually owned oh. by it's called the new company is called bending spoons bending out spoons. of italy okay yep it, it just transacted about about two weeks ago so about I'm a right. week and a half ago so it's it's fresh I'm so right, i'm writing that down i want to look that up <laughs> Yeah, so the same company owns Meetup, um, the Meetup app. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. If you've ever used that to go to a local Meetup or something like that, mm -hmm. that's the platform. That's the other tool that they use. They have a bunch of other apps too. Awesome. All right, Rob. Well, let's get into it. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming on the show. Like y you, you are one of the original. Like you have been around the podcasting scene since 1999 you had said you know mm -hmm. and uh yeah i didn't personally personally i didn't know podcasting was around since 1999 well technically it didn't actually really kick off until 2004 okay so, 
So I started more on the radio and was doing like streaming online and was doing other types of podcast like um, kind of activities mm -hmm. um, that were using more proprietary platforms at that time. It wasn't based on RSS. Um, so RSS really kind of kicked off between really between 2000 really and 2004. So 2000 was about when the, the technology, the RSS was invented by a guy, a guy by the name of Dave Weiner. Mm. Um, so he, he came up with the concept and the, the architecture of it, um, but it wasn't really even deployed in any kind of a way that could be used, used by anybody until about 2004. So in that year, like in mid 2004, because I started utilizing the enclosure tag in my blog RSS feed in September of 2004. And that was about the time frame that that most others were starting to come into it and actually give the ability to feed readers essentially in the early days and then the Windows Media Player and then thus later the Apple um, um, iTunes application would support the enclosure tag in blog RSS feeds and that's kind of where this all started and it I think it all kind of came out of this this whole movement in that same time frame around and actually earlier um, around um, the music platform uh, Napster. Okay. So people were sharing MP3 files of music um, with each other back then to right. kind of pirate um, the music industry. And sharing, were yeah. Getting, getting <laughs> free music and things like that. And that's, I think that, that's where the idea of this came out of because um, um, Mr. Adam Curry, who came, you know, he was a VJ on MTV. Mm -hmm. So Adam Curry had a very strong linkage to the music industry as well. So he's the one that kind of put all the pieces together and, and came up with this concept. You know, it, you know, he's also kind of a radio broadcast guy and all this stuff. So you can kind of see how music and broadcasting kind of converged with him. And then he kind of had a high profile and was able to bring attention to this new technology with Dave Weiner. And uh, thus we got, you know, this big hype around podcasting back in that time frame about the 2003 or, well, there was a little bit that started to bubble up in late 2003. And then 2004 is when it really started to get widespread kind of press coverage and media. And Adam was out there, you know, on the, the front page of USA Today and things like that, talking about this new upstart medium called podcasting. And and so, but it was really a stick it to the man medium. It was really kind of at, at that time, it was very anti-commercial. It was very anti-establishment. It was very much in the context of Napster, right? Which was, right. you know, stealing music of sorts. So, <laughs> so it was like, you know, this kind of anti kind of establishment type of a medium. And that's where podcasting really started. And that's where, where you had, I faced a lot of criticism in the early days of podcasting because I was doing a commercial radio show. Mm. So I, I had ads in my show <laughs> and back in those days you didn't have ads in your show. It was just one of those, it, it just wasn't a cultural fit. Um, so it was like radio and podcasting were like antithetical to each other back in those days. And so if you had ads in your show, you were more like commercial radio. And that was what, this is what this medium was trying to rebel against mm -hmm. was that establishment media, which was commercial radio because it had too many ads and it was, so people were very hypersensitive to the over commercialization of this, of this area of podcasting. And, but as we kind of moved into the early part of that period, there was another funny thing that happened with commercialism with podcasting that doesn't get talked about much either is is that podcasters were starting to take on advertising um, and sponsorship deals, and they didn't feel any kind of obligation to um, pump up their advertiser uh, about how good they were. So mm -hmm. let's say an advertiser came in and sponsored their show. It was like a, like maybe a bed manufacturer or something like that, like, you know, a right. fold-out bed or something like that. And oftentimes those manufacturers would send the bed as a sample to the podcaster so they they would be able to do a genuine testimonial <laughs> right. or for the the product right and so it was not unusual for 
them to take the money, get the free product, try it out, and then get on the show and give a honest review. I mean, from what their experience, if it caused them back pain, they would tell them it. <laughs> this bed caused me back pain. <laughs> you know, so you can kind of see what I'm trying to say. It was, you know, and then we've kind of evolved over the last probably 10 years plus approximately about how we become a little bit more like commercial radio um, with sure. sponsorships and advertising and things like that, that where people talk positively about their sponsors. Um <laughs> So, but people would talk positively about their sponsors if they really liked the product and really thought it was a good quality product. So that's where we saw this kind of testimonial type of orientation and trust that came from the podcast medium is that mm. podcast listeners were conditioned from their early days to believe the host, right? Right. To take their recommendation because they could give a negative one or they could give a, a positive one. It could go either way. Where now I think there's an expectation that everything is positive. There's no <laughs> honest reviews anymore, right? So that just kind of gives you a little bit of a contrast of the spectrum of over the last 20 years. Yeah, you know, you know I, I think hosts are pressured into doing positive reviews, you know, if they're getting paid for it. You know, no, yeah, it makes sense in a way, sure. too, right? <laughs> but but maybe it's a little dishonest, though. That's the that's yeah. the flip side to it. Yeah, right. It might it might be it might be a little dishonest because the, the the you know the product might be bad. It might be terrible. It may not be but... that great, right? But <laughs> yeah. I'm saying it is right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. man. So, um, looking back on your career, like, like I said, you've been in this industry a long time. Um, yeah. what, what was your first show that you ever did? Oh, it was the, the web talk world radio show. So web I, talk. I walked into a radio station up in the Seattle market and mm -hmm. started doing this show in, uh, I think it was February of 20 or of, um, 1999. So just wa walked in, asked the radio station if they had any program talking about computers or the internet or anything like that. And they said no. And, mm -hmm. and I had a couple of friends that I, that were also passionate about what was happening with the internet. And so we all got together and just went into the radio station every Saturday morning and started doing a, a fun show. You know, like my, um, one of my co-hosts did a show or did the show under kind of a character of being a uh, crash test mark so he would come in and talk about the the latest software that he experienced that crashed his computer and so we would talk about that kind of stuff and then we you know we, we talk about other things too that we would see that were funny that were happening with the internet right some of these new startups like uh there was a platform that was being built to that was going to share smells across the internet right so you could transmit odors between computers. Yeah. I mean, those kind of things were some of the things that we talked about on that show, but then, right. then on a more serious note, um, I don't know, we would have a guest on from Symantec or from Microsoft or whatever, talking about the latest, you know, web browser or something like that, that they were releasing or Gmail. And I got like 10,000 free Gmail accounts from Google <laughs> and I gave them away on the, on the radio show. And yeah, so people would have to write me and request, access to gmail so google gave me all these gmail accounts to give away wow. on my show so i did that kind of stuff so i was sending out thousands of emails out to my listeners that were wanting a free account <laughs> <laughs> so it was back in that time time it was an invite only kind of a thing yeah so, i mean now anybody and and and, and their mother can really create a yeah so i i kind of <laughs> contributed to the creation of some of these things by the topics that i had on my show and i was on about 15 broadcast stations and i was on a, on the xm south that uh, radio network for a couple of years through a distribution deal that i had that's so, awesome awesome it, you, you know yeah. like looking over your linkedin uh credentials you know everything you put on on linkedin and just like basically stalking it's not even you. complete it's not even complete yeah, on there like, either I, yeah i cut it off <laughs> like like basically just stalking you on social media right. you know like, yeah. um you know i i do notice and the and the, and the stories you, you've actually just been telling me within the first two minutes you know it's it's kind of like 
you know, you've been ahead of your game, you know, like you love technology. You love being one step ahead. You love like saying, okay, well, what's coming next, you know, and, uh, you know, how can I leverage it and how can I use it to my advantage? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so that's right. My, I mean, my background is a marketing um, guy. I have a marketing degree and things like that. And so I saw the internet as a as a terrific way to create direct relationships with customers, mm -hmm. right? Um, one to one. And then I started using my show as a content marketing strategy, right? Make those connections, share knowledge and information and create promotions, use content. Like I, I used to work for the Florida department of citrus too. Mm -hmm. And I used the internet to promote, citrus and orange juice and things like that. And so I used the internet. I built the first Florida citrus industry website wow. and I would give away like, um, recipes to use citrus to create smoothies and, and dishes and with chicken and fish and all sorts of stuff <laughs> off, off of the website. Right. So I would be giving away, um, almost like crayon books for kids. I would, I would, have a sweepstakes for a sailboat that I would give away in working with a, like a grocery retailer. So, wow. so it was really kind of a, a tool that I used in the early days to, um, to reach customers directly. And nice. it was kind of new at the time. Nice. Well, um, talk, talk to me a little bit about how you got the senior vice president account, uh, position at, uh, Podbean. Like, you know, Podbean, you, you've worked for Podbean, Libsyn, Spreaker, like you have worked for all of the major, like podcasting hosting platforms. Like, well, uh, it's as far as, mo I mean, two of the original ones. Yeah. I would say. And then Spreaker, um, was kind of an upstart when I started with them because they were based in Europe and they really didn't have a strong presence in the U S mm -hmm. and now they're owned by iHeart. So you can kind of see how that mapped, <laughs> but, but it was really, you know, it was just, I left Lipson and, and I just, I, I had an opportunity. I was available and, and they needed somebody at the time. And I was considering a couple different roles and mm. I chose them, you know, I kind of, I kind of went back to what I had been doing for many years, which was working with podcast hosting and distribution platforms. But, okay. but yeah, I haven't worked for Spotify and I haven't worked for Apple and I haven't worked for those folks, even though I've had a lot of dealings with all those guys and, and Google too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked for quite a few companies, but mainly on the distribution side, but I also, uh, I used to work for podcast one, which was a ad sales kind of podcast network out of Los Angeles. Um, that was kind of a merger between syndicated radio and podcasting in the, back in 2014 is when I worked there. And so that was kind of an interesting time for podcasting. As you think about that company was run by the guy that invented syndicated commercial radio. Um, right. I mean, I mean, so that's what was interesting about that role for me and my background mm. was that radio connection. Um, and that was a formidable time. I didn't spend a lot of time there. And then I left there to go to the speaker after spending seven years at Microsoft. Right. So, right. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I was going to ask you, do you think your, your radio background really influenced your podcasting, uh, your transition into podcasting? Well, yeah, I mean, it definitely led me into it um, just by the fact that I was creating content at a radio station and that content was all about the growth and development of technology right. and how technology was used with content. So it, in some ways, the mapping of the two and some of the platforms that I was working with, even in the early days of like 2002 and 2003, um, were like precursor platforms to what we know today as podcasting mm. and, and where the, the same methodology was being used. It just was being used in a proprietary methodology versus open RSS, which is more of an open standard that, um, later took over. But back in the early days, I, I had a deal with Microsoft, uh, through a platform called sync and go. Mm -hmm. And they basically had a client application that you could install, you could get for Windows um, 
more specifically Windows XP back in those days. And that would synchronize content from your, your computer with a pocket PC device, which would be equivalent to an iPod. Mm. So it had a large screen on it that was running a, a mobile version of the Windows operating system, right? So you could transfer audio and video files from your computer to this portable media player. Right. And so I had a deal with Microsoft. That was one of only three audio content providers to work with that platform. Um, so, and I got paid per transfer. So if a listener transferred an episode of my show from windows to this pocket PC device, I got paid 25 cents every time that happened. So it was a licensing deal. So, and it, it was a pretty lucrative deal at the time. I yeah. Mean, it was, I mean, the was, CPM was kind of low on that, right? <laughs> so. Well, 25 cents per drought per transfer of a media file was I think I was making on average probably about 5,000 a month from that, just oh. that deal. Oh, wow. Okay. Back, never mind. Back then. <laughs> yeah. So, well, because back at the time, I think there was close to 3 million users of the platform right? Um, at the time, but it only had 13 content creators on it. Wow. So, but they were large content creators like from Forbes and business wow. 2.0 magazine and, and MSNBC and, and, ABC News and those kind of folks were the other partners with this. So, so, so it was audio and video is what right. it was, but it was mostly video. And so what, what those major media companies would do was upload short segments of a video from programs that they were producing. Um, mm. So it'd be like maybe five minute clips or something like that from the evening news they would publish up there. And, and, and then there was like three audio programs that were on there. And most of the audio shows that were on there were, had this kind of hybrid kind of digital distribution through direct download off their website, um, mm. as well as maybe some radio aspect to what they were doing at the time. I mean, if you think about 2002, podcasting really hadn't taken off yet. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Like these are like seriously like the early days of podcasting. That's amazing. Like, yeah, and there was other platforms too that were doing similar things to what Microsoft was doing. Um, uh, what one was called Serenade, and it had a a very similar type of a transfer experience. And then then another one that came up um, was one that was um, I'm trying to remember the name of it right now, but but it basically recorded the audio off of my streams. Mm -hmm. So I also was streaming via r real networks. I was also streaming via, via the windows media player streams right. as well that this platform would capture the audio from my stream. So it would record it over the internet and then create an MP3 file and then make that available to their users. Wow. So, <laughs> so you ha had this kind of, um, taking radio, streaming radio, and converting it into a downloadable MP3 file through their platform um, that I was working with back then too. So I didn't really have to do anything. I just had to give them my link to my streaming show, mm -hmm. and and they would do all the, all the work for the customer. So I didn't have to do the encoding into MP3 or anything like that. It would mm -hmm. be done automatically for the user. Right. So. <laughs> Wow. There's all sorts of platforms. So people were playing with a lot of these concepts um, before podcasting started. And I was playing with them too because I was in tune to what was happening right. with, with those type of methodologies back in those days because I was trying to build my, um, my, my online distribution of my content. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and I think it shows because now you're currently working with StreamYard and um, you're – officially the, the content creator partner of StreamYard. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I'm not surprised, you know, be, <laughs> because, you know, like you started in the early days of podcasting and you've always, I think, been an innovator in the field. And, you know, you've always looked one step further and trailblazed away, you know, and, mm -hmm. You know, now video is really the future, I think, of what podcasting is going to become, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's really what I wanted to talk to you about, because I wanted to 
I, I really want to talk to you about what I, what I think, you know, the future of podcasting is going to be is basically what I like to call vodcasting, right? Mm -hmm. So it's video on demand, you know, yep. like a podcaster, but, um, you know, so working with StreamYard, it's, it's, it's kind of a no brainer because StreamYard had become this basic powerhouse during the pandemic. You know, aside from mm -hmm. right, I think right next to Zoom, right? So mm -hmm. Zoom's quality was meh, kind of okay, yeah. right? But StreamYard was always like, okay, I could actually record an episode over here, uh, kind of like what we're doing today. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically the same thing, you know, yeah. and it sounds, I think, what I think, 10 times better than Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk to me about how you decided to work with StreamYard and what what your premise is on the future of podcasting, like with video. Well, the whole kind of StreamYard relationship uh, really, really has developed over many years because I, when StreamYard started, I had Gage um, Vandentop, who's one of the co-founders, um, on my show that I did that um the, the show that's behind me or the new media show. I've been doing that live online show for about 13 years or so. Okay. And so that, yeah, I had him on as a guest. So I got to meet him and build a relationship with him. And, and then also, um, you know, he's a younger guy. He was in his twenties when he started StreamYard. So he was very, very ahead of his time too, really when it came right. to this kind of stuff and was at the right place at the right time of sorts with his ideas with this platform. And so it just kind of grew. And then I left Podbean and I was looking for something else to work on and was thinking a lot about video at that time uh, because of what I was seeing um, with the interest that was building um, at YouTube, mm -hmm. which I've been monitoring and being involved in um, podcasting at Google for, for many years, not working for them, but being, you know, doing calls with them and meetings with them in the early days when they were uh, formulating their strategy for Google podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to live up in Seattle. I don't live in Seattle anymore, but they, their, their Google podcast team was based in, in, um, in Seattle. So I would just pop down and have group lunches with them and talk about podcasting. I mean, a lot of them were, were pretty young people and, they didn't have a lot of experience with the industry. And so I spent a lot of time with them just kind of bringing them up to speed with what's happening in the medium and giving them some advice about ways to navigate various issues. And mm -hmm. they, they wound up, uh, you know, launching a decent platform that over the subsequent years captured probably 5% of the market, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, there hasn't been too many platforms, um, really since Zoom, the platform that I worked on at, at Microsoft that captured more than maybe four or 5% of the podcast market. Um, and, and I think the most recent uh, progress that uh, Spotify has made has been the only other example um, of a platform that has a solid or even maybe exceeds Apple in some aspects. Right. of a platform with podcasting. So it's, it's kind of rare to see one of these platforms really do well. And it was sad to see Google decide to shut down Google podcasts because they were carving out a, a significant chunk of the podcast consumption side mm -hmm. and making good progress at that. Um, because we, we, we've been seeing for years kind of like the opportunity of Android really not be fully taken advantage of. Um, in the podcasting space because Apple's really dominated it. Right? Sure. And, and there's so many people with Android devices around the world that it's just obvious that it's an opportunity. So with Google leaving uh, podcasting with their Google podcast platform, now granted they've picked up some of this with um, YouTube, but it's not the same. It's not going to probably be the same type of market capture that we saw with Google podcasts. Right. Uh, but that's just my own thought on it. I'm sure YouTube has their own thought on it. Um, but it's so Spotify is really, I, I think benefited probably likely will be the beneficiary of Google podcasts getting out of the market. Um, mm -hmm. And 
they'll they will continue to do well on Android devices because they have an app on Android, and Apple doesn't have an app on Android yet. Right. So that's a big hole that Apple has left out there for someone else to come in and take a bunch of market share away from them. Yeah. So, and I think I think Spotify is succeeding at doing a lot of that. Well, I mean, and speaking of Spotify, I I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are with uh, them letting Joe Rogan out of their uh, contract. What do you think about that? Well, he's still under contract with them. Well, he so is, he, but it's not exclusive, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, it's not, yeah. It's not only, not just publishing directly only to to Spotify, which I think in hindsight, I think, they would probably say that maybe that was a little bit of a mistake, but at the time it probably didn't seem like it was a mistake because mm. Spotify was trying to do like what Sirius XM did with Howard Stern was, right. you know, get this big name on their platform and it would attract users to feel like they had to go over to Spotify if they wanted to follow Joe. Right. So, and I think that's what they accomplished. So they got a lot of that migration to occur they grew their podcast consumption platform and then, but they realized that given what was happening in the market around advertising right now, it's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of a dip in advertising activity and podcasting right now because of the economy Right. that it might make more sense to let Joe distribute outside of Spotify because then it would probably increase his numbers and generate more revenue uh, because of the higher numbers that he would get by being more widely distributed, mm -hmm. which means more, more revenue potential for Spotify. Right. Yeah. So, I'm sure they're getting a cut out of everything that he's oh yeah. doing, you know? <laughs> well, they're selling all, I mean, they're involved in kind of trafficking his ads sure. and his program and right. selling them into his program. Joe is, you know, is, is getting a royalty payment. I don't mm -hmm. know if he's getting any kind of a commission on the, sales or not that would be probably hard to justify at a 250 million dollar contract but um but yeah that's crazy <laughs> yeah it, it, it's kind of it's kind of the equivalent of like celine dion only playing in vegas you know right <laughs> right so i mean i think joe's opportunity is a lot greater on, on this new strategy because he can he can um, be heard on all these new platforms right. he can also his whole full show can be seen on youtube too so yeah you know you think about the implications of that too is you know i know spotify wanted to progress pretty aggressively into video on their platform and i think they're continuing to do so it's just they just realize that they can't really bottle up joe too much on that side they, they need to let him breathe <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man but um but yeah, I mean, go, like going back to the original conversation, you and I, you know, we were talking about live streaming. We were talking about StreamYard, you know, and, um, you know, like live streaming, I think because I still get a lot of, I've been doing this for almost five years now. Right. And it's, trust me, it's not quite as long as you. Um, <laughs> okay. Five years is still a long time. <laughs> I love it. I, I, you know, I, I love this medium. You know, I love trying to think i'm just like you i love trying to think ahead and what's next right so you know i remember back in 2019 when you know the pandemic was really first starting and people were just yeah. starting to get into podcasting and everybody started podcasting um you know and i know i want to clear the air a little bit to say that you know i did not start podcasting because of the pandemic right <laughs> I started podcasting because I was looking for a new hobby, right? I was looking for yeah. just something to do. And I loved, you know, radio. I loved, oh, you know, and I had no experience in it. I had never listened to a podcast before uh, I started recording and I just decided to do it. But, you know, but then the pandemic hit and everybody was podcasting. And I'm like, all right, well, what's the next step? I'm like live streaming. Okay. So at the time I was working on another show on my original show and I had a co-host and I tell my co-host, I'm like, listen, we, we're going to start doing weekly live shows on live on, um, uh, uh stream you know, and 
he's like, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, and you know, he had gotten into it because of the microphone, because you know, it was just voice. It was just you know, he didn't have to be in front of the camera, but. You know, and then once I said, okay, I'm going to introduce a camera to the show. Uh, he's like, all right, yeah, cool. And, um, you know, but for me, it was kind of a, a growth, you know, because I, before this, I was more reserved. I was more quiet, shy and, you know, but here I actually had to put on a show. I had to like keep yeah. people interested, you know? And, uh, and live streaming really changed during the pandemic. I think, it, uh, can you speak a little bit to, uh, how live streaming has picked up, uh, recently for podcasting? Well, I think it's a complicated, uh, dynamic that's going on. That's that kind of came out of the pandemic. I, I think a lot of people got upgrades to their, their webcams or they got a webcam. Maybe they right. didn't have one before. I know that the the major media folks were really on full display for, for how, you know, inept they were at um, doing things from home. <laughs> um, it's like, well, welcome to becoming a podcaster, you know, <laughs> right. uh, you know uh, Mr. Adam, you know, or was it uh, his name from CNN Cooper? Um, Anderson so, Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anderson Cooper. Welcome to podcasting. Right. Um, right. <laughs> You know, so it was like, you know, and a lot of these big, big media anchors and stars and stuff like that were, were really put in a kind of a challenging situation where they had to adapt to this new digital creation type of a at home kind of thing, which all of us have been dealing with for a while. Right. And it was kind of funny to watch um, them struggle with this and, and figure it out. But and I kind of went through it myself too, because I wasn't really focused on getting studio lights. I, I didn't have all that stuff because mostly what I was doing was audio. Mm -hmm. So, and then I upgraded my camera. So I have a 4k um, camcorder camera from Sony that I have behind a teleprompter. And, and so it's, I definitely stepped it up. I mean, I had a, you know, I've had this, this microphone since 2009 or 2008. So yeah. I've had a good quality audio recording kind of tool set for a very long time. Um, it's quite different than what I had when I started, when I was doing my radio show. I kind of, I mean, I could talk about that, but that was most of the equipment that I had back in those days was really music equipment. Uh, right. It was high-end condenser microphones. I had to sound pad all my, my, my bedroom. Um, so I, I really had to be careful what I did around the microphone because it, it would create that, you know, that thumping sound or you'd hear every little aspect of what I was doing. So you had to be very careful. And then I had music recording software. It was called Cubasis at the time. And, yes. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so I had, um, you know, I had a dual hybrid, which means I could bring in phone calls into my show, you know, with my guests. I mean, a lot of the guests back in those days didn't do there wasn't zoom or there wasn't a stream yard back in those days. So the only way I could get guests into my show was through a phone call. Mm. So I had to have a digital hybrid that could take phone calls into my, my mixer, which was a, a 16 channel mixer. I, at the time, I didn't, I probably didn't need 16 channels, but I, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit overkill. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but it was what we'll say. It was like maybe four feet by four feet square. So you can imagine, you know, how big this thing is. And, <laughs> And then I have, you know, I have now, I have a little um, Roadcaster Pro here sit, sit, sitting on a rack here and, mm -hmm. and it's much smaller and it has everything inside of it. I mean, I can fully record with this thing. It's got compressors right. built into it, all this stuff, which is, I'd have separate devices for all this stuff in the early days. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. So it was really kind of quite a, quite a difference in the technology has gotten so much better, well, but yeah. it has it is pretty complex still. I mean, it is complex. It, it was complicated back then in a different way right. um, than it is now where you had to work with like um, patch bays and you had, you know, tape recorders and CD players. And <laughs> it was, those are the good quite, old days. <laughs> quite different back then um, <laughs> on that side. Um, but it, it certainly is made doing this kind of content um, 
a lot higher quality now. So I, right. I think the cameras are good. The bandwidth is so much better than it used to be. And the microphones and the ability to um, record is, is so much easier now than it used to be. I mean, do you, do you and, think that the, the quality of the technology compared to the price point of what it costs, which really isn't so bad, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, can independent podcasters really compare to really professionally produced shows? Yeah, I think they can. And I think m most of the time what we do here is good enough. Um, and it's, you know, I, I have to say my early studio that I had for my radio show had better quality mics than even this. Um, okay. Those 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 condenser mics that I had from Audio Technica, they were like seven hundred dollars each. What were you using? The RE twenties? No, no, it was an Audio Audio Technica. I can't remember. It was like a eighty four or sixty four or something like that. Okay, but they were these vertical mics that had like shock mounts around them and things like that. And you had to have like a pop filter on them. Right. Because if you talked into it, it would definitely pop. So you had to have a filter on them. Yeah. So it wasn't really conducive to doing video um, because then that pop filter would, would block your face. I mean, it would be like right here, <laughs> right. you know, it's like, I would be like talking into it and all you see is this big round thing in front of my face. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> So now I have the, you know, I have a foam thing that. that yeah, kind of you use the, the Shure kind of, SM7B, right. Yeah, it's the same yeah. one I have, yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, and that accomplishes kind of the same thing, but it means I can get up closer on the mic and I can talk into it and I can also do video now because it doesn't block my face. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's kind of practical things about this stuff too, but the hardware and the software and stuff have gotten a lot more advanced. But I right. think the really big revolution was the amount of bandwidth that we have and broadband connection and things like that. Because in the early days, a lot of the content I was making back in those days, I, I had to distribute it in like uh, 32K, maybe 16K um, in the, the playback bit rate um, yeah. because people were still on dial-up connections back in those days. Right. And so, you know, you really couldn't do much video back in those days. And if you did, it was very poor quality. So yeah. people weren't really consuming much of it. Right. I mean, if anything, it was probably like the super early days of YouTube also, you know, so yeah. you, <laughs> you weren't yeah. really posting videos on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> can, can you talk a little bit about um, what podcasting 2.0? Because... Um, mm -hmm. There, there is a huge difference between podcasting 2.0 and what podcasting used to be, right? So there are expanded uh, tags or expanded things that you can add now to your RSS uh, to basically give your show more features. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let me back up on podcasting 2.0 a little bit because it's it's been a, a, a growing kind of awareness that's been happening around some of the the potential tag improvements that can be added to RSS. Right. Um, and it's been kind of a slow development because a lot of those new ideas and those new tags for functionality in, in the listening apps have been a little slow to be adopted mm. uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the biggest reasons is, is that Apple is usually the one that dictates um, with their namespace. A Apple, if you don't know, Apple has its own podcasting, what's called namespace. It's basically where they um, have specified the tags that they want to see in an RSS feed so they can, they can properly ingest your podcast and provide them the metadata or the links or whatever information they need to have to properly um, display your podcast in their platform. So, so if Apple made a change to any of that, they added a new tag or they removed a new tag, the whole industry kind of like um, said, yeah, we'll get it done next week. Right. It was like, we will, we will get it done as soon as possible because Apple had that kind of power in the space um, where what they said, kind of everybody said, you know, how to how high to jump and we're we're going to jump that high 
Wow. And so really it, it created this atmosphere where Apple was really kind of almost like a dictator to the industry saying, this is what you're going to do and you're going to do it. Also your show's not going to be able to be easily discovered in our platform or whatever. So they kind of had the industry over a barrel to some degree, mm -hmm. but looking at podcasting 2.0, it's like where the industry has said, well, we have ideas from an industry perspective and we would like to come up with these new ideas and be proactively pushing them on the industry, right? And say, this is what we as an industry want as far as functionality, just to give an example, to share comments, right? Across listening apps. Right. So that's a tag that's in the spec of this new podcasting 2.0 initiative. And then also what's called alternative enclosures. So you could have conceivably uh, links to two media files in one item post in your RSS feed. So you could have a, a YouTube link and you could have a, a audio or video link, or you could have in one item tag, you could have an audio link and a video link. Mm -hmm. So, cause podcasting has always been kind of like a, a, a platform or a, uh, a consumption tool that supports audio and video not just audio. I think a lot of people think that podcasting is primarily has always been just an audio medium, right. but it has not. Um, the very early days of podcasting, there were whole startup companies that had VC investment that were just doing video podcasting, like big media companies. I mean, a lot of those companies sold to like discovery channel and things like that. And mm. this was like back in the 2008, nine, 10 timeframe. Okay. Um, and so there were a lot of video podcasters and even NBC, NBC news, you know, those folks would put RSS feeds out that had video programs like the MS NBC platform would put out the full Rachel Maddow show out in a video podcast back in those days. And so you could, you could almost have a television experience. I mean, I built a Zoom video podcast platform into the Windows Media Center back in that time frame. Yeah. That's how much video content there were that was a video podcast. I remember that right. platform, yeah. Right. So it was an era that YouTube came in and said, you know, we're launching with video. And that's when a lot of the video podcasters migrated over to YouTube was mm. because it was free hosting. You didn't have to pay for the bandwidth to deliver those video files, which all those video podcasters were being required to do. And it was kind of expensive back then. Mm. So, so, but YouTube was saying, well, upload it to us and we'll pay for the bandwidth to d deliver those videos to your listeners or your viewers. And, and that's what everybody did. Mm. And that's what basically crashed the video podcasting side of podcasting to some degree. Um, my new media show still does a video podcast. So you can get the video version of that show in the Apple podcast app today. It's the same with my show that I do for StreamYard. There's a video version that's in Apple podcast right now of that StreamYard show that I do wow. it has all the episodes in there as well as a version that's audio as well. But the podcasting 2.0 project is trying to converge all that stuff and also have links using what's called the lit tag that mm -hmm. will enable the listening app to be notified when there's a live podcast. Ooh. So, you know, when there's a live streaming experience of a podcast. So like some of the platforms are starting to embrace that as well. And then some of them are starting to move towards being able to embed a YouTube link into right. that, um, that alternative enclosure tag to make your YouTube video available right next to your, your audio podcast. Right. So, In, so you see that, that was another question I was going to ask you because YouTube had just recently launched the podcast uh, section of their website. Uh, where you can put in the RSS feed of your podcast. Or the audio going in, right. Right. Yeah. So is that part of podcasting 2.0? No, has nothing to do with it. Okay. So that's totally a, that's totally an initiative of, um, of YouTube okay. to capture podcast content for, for their, their primarily their YouTube music platform. Right. Okay. So if, yeah. So if you think about, most of these platforms, like, you know, 
Amazon Music, whatever, they're doing the same exact thing that YouTube is doing. They're mm. ingesting audio into their platform. But the difference between Amazon Music ingesting audio podcasts mm. is that those are audio podcasts going into Amazon Music. YouTube is doing something different. They're taking that audio when they import it and then they're re-encoding it into a video file because mm. YouTube doesn't support any audio. There's no audio on YouTube. Right. None of it is audio. Right. It may look like it's audio, but it's actually a video file, so, right. which means yeah. that the, the, the original version of that show, which was given to them as an MP3 file is not being played. So that's turned into something else, which means that it can't be updated. Right. So there's a breakage in that connection. Oh, um, okay. So you can't do like dynamic advertising. You can't do any kind of updates right. to that content and, and have it get fed into YouTube. Because once they've captured one version of it, they convert it into a completely new file mm. that can't be updated. Um, so you have to go into the YouTube tool and be able to manipulate it over there. Okay. So you can't do it through your RSS feed. So there is some technical differences between the integrations. Um, but just keep in mind, YouTube is primarily a video platform. Yeah, so, it's like a totally different animal than, you know, podcasting. And they're just... Yeah, or like an Apple podcast or uh, even an Amazon Music or a Spotify or any of that. It's completely different. Right, right, right. Um, I, I use Buzzsprout as a host for the show, right? Yeah. Um, and Buzzsprout just released a new feature called fan mail, right? Mm -hmm. So fan mail allows uh, listeners to basically like text, text message or me just message the hosts of the show mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. directly from the episode, like right before the, the description of the, sh of the episode. Um, is that part of podcast 2.0? Like the, I don't believe so. I think they've they've gone out and done something. As far as I know, the podcasting 2.0 initiative, I don't believe has any connection to texting. Okay. So that's an initiative that they just kind of did on their own. Okay, uh, so it's just a platform feature that they're offering and that's just the, for them. Yeah, as far as I know, it's not part of the podcast 2.0 um, kind of like tag um, offering. Right. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't be at some point, but it's, as far as I know, currently it's not. Yeah. But there's like maybe a dozen different new tags that are being proposed. Um, one was recently adopted by Apple, which was the transcript tag right. that came out of the podcasting 2.0 project. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of a crack in the opportunity here that maybe these big platforms will adopt some of these new ideas mm -hmm. in the podcast 2.0, you know, spec. And, and we may see some of these kind of more advanced concepts come to th these major platforms as they realize that maybe they need to show a little bit of uh, support for ideas that are coming out of the industry, not just their own ideas, yeah. um, which has been the history of all this. Yeah, it, it, it really seemed in podcasting 1.0 that Apple really had a monopoly on the whole market, right? Um, with podcasting 2.0, it really opens up a lot of things. Is is there now uh, like a, a depository, a, a repository of um, data that somebody can go and pull like all the active podcasts? Like, you know, instead of relying on apple yeah it's uh it's called the podcast index okay. um it's at podcastindex.org um is the place to go go check that out uh it's it's got a complete catalog of all the podcasts in the industry um that's separate from apple or separate from spotify or and then another one that's out there that's being kept up to date is being managed by blueberry which is run by my co-host of my new media show, Todd mm -hmm. Cochran. So, so it's another independent directory of the whole podcast medium. Great. Right. Right. So there right. are, there has been a recognition that, um, that there was a need to have an independent kind of an independent kind of directory out there of all the podcasts, because 
because a lot of the listening apps today uh, pull from the Apple podcast uh, APIs, which basically right. is the directory the uh, podcast that Apple maintains. Mm -hmm. And so if Apple decided next week that they were going to cut off that API connection, that would mean that all these independent podcast apps, you know, it's like maybe close to a hundred of them uh, would lose access to getting the latest podcasts. Yeah. Um, so there needed to be a couple of alternative directories out there that those independent apps could tap into if they needed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them today tap into Apple and they tap into the podcast index. And, and that is, is they're kind of covering their bases. So if something goes down, right. they have a backup. It's like a <laughs> right. backup. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, is, is that basically where like everybody's getting like the rankings of podcasts, like who's number one or top 10, you know? Yeah. I mean, not so much, um, like the pod track, um, tracking that is an independent kind of tracking URL that a certain group of shows supports in their URLs, okay. um, that, that gives data to a pod track about the, the download activity of their programs. And that's one of the, even Triton Digital has one of those as well uh, that, that, that tracks the success of certain shows and certain networks and things like that. But the thing to keep in mind with most of those is that they don't track the whole industry. Mm. All they track is just the shows and the networks that support their, their redirect that they have that's associated with their media file links. Um, so it's very proprietary to the, just the set of shows that they have a partnership with. So it's, it's probably like maybe 10 or 15% of the whole podcast market. So there isn't one platform that really does a, does a very deep dive tracking of the whole industry. There should be. And th <laughs> well, yeah, but it's difficult to get everybody together, right? Right. Not everybody wants to work with one entity because they don't trust one entity necessarily. Yeah. They want to, yeah, it's, it's been one of those challenges that the industry has had is that, you know, who, who would everyone in the industry trust with their, their show information and their show data? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's been one of the challenges that the industry has is that there really hasn't been one group or one platform or one technology solution here that would enable that. Now there's been some folks that have played around the edges, like, uh, you know, there's been a few companies that have tried to do this, mm -hmm. um, with all of them have had kind of limited success, like pod chaser is one and, and there's been a couple others, but none of them have been able to accomplish a comprehensive kind of view of the podcasting space short of the podcast index, which is probably as close as we have been able to uh, obtain that. Hmm. Wow. Um, I recently seen the interview you did with Rena Friedman Watts on, oh, yeah, right. on better call daddy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I recently had her on my other show. So, uh, mm. Rena is a good friend of mine. You know, she, she's, yeah. she's great. Um, and you guys were talking a little bit about AI, you know, so, you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about AI with podcasting. Like, how do you think, because there's really an AI revolution going on right about now, you know, with all this chat GPT and, you know, all this other platforms of AI, like, how do you think AI is going to influence podcasting? Well, I think it's already influencing it in a significant way already. Um, but I think that the thing to take away from that is, is that it's, I don't know that it's as significant um, as I, I guess many think it is right now to podcasting. I still think that the tools and the, the, these large language models are still in their infancy about what they're capable of doing and what they're, what they should be used for um, mm -hmm. is a little bit of a conflict right now. I'm not, I use them all the time myself um, and find myself having to edit them all the time. Sure. So it's, it's not a solution, a, a complete solution to anything. Right. 
and I, and I do question whether or not it ever will be, but because humans have a different desire to create content than a computer does, right? Mm -hmm. There's different concepts that come into creating content um, that a computer j either just doesn't get or can't really know what you are as a podcaster are thinking about when you do your show, what your purpose is, what's the, what should be the, the topics of it, what should be the, the flow of it, how is it presented in metadata and images. Um, I'm not sure that there's that kind of capability. And mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a creative element here that goes beyond the capability of, a, of an AI to, to, to really do. I think, you know, I've used it to create images, you know, thumbnails. I've used it to create um, episode art. I've used it to create, right. you know, master art for my podcast, my logo for my company, you know. So it has some practical application, but, you know, small things like being able to spell a word correctly is still a little bit out of its reach. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, those are the kind of things I'm talking about, right? It's right. almost like, trying to rely on a five-year-old to manage your, your hundred thousand employee corporation. Right. right. It, it just, it's not there yet. Right. Yeah. So that's not to say that it, it can't be, or it won't be. It just, it's still really early days. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah. I think I, at least the podcasters that I talk to, you know, they, uh, they're not heavily relying on, like no. chat, chat GPT right. and AI, but what they are doing, they are using it for like show descriptions, right? Yeah. So, you know, they would yeah. say, Hey, chat GPT, write me a show description. I talked to so-and-so about this and this and this, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, but yeah, or a show summary or, uh, right. You yeah, know, yeah. so they're, they're using it as a tool opposed to just do it for me kind of thing, you know? And uh, yeah, and then you still have to go through it. And if you, uh, like I use chat GPT, I have the full four version and, right. and I'll, I'll create some text with it. And then I pull it into my Google docs or into word or whatever. And my Grammarly tears it apart. <laughs> So, <laughs> right. which is another AI. So now we're all, already <laughs> seeing AI battling AI here around the content that's being created. Yeah. And I, I, I had on my show, Grammar Girl, um, um, Mignon Fogarty, who is in the podcast Hall of Fame, and she's a, a famous, you know, kind of writer. She's been on Oprah and all this stuff, and and she's been evaluating, you know, what Chat GPT generates it from a language and an English expert mm -hmm. versus what Grammarly does. And she says that chat GPT is actually better than Grammarly. Wow. So as far as the output that it gets, um, and so when a lesser platform is ripping apart chat GPT generated content, then maybe we're going backwards right? as far as Mignon's concerned. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we're at with it right now. And it's like, you know, some of these things are just human creativity is really behind them. And, and it's maybe, you know, there's some element here that AI just hasn't caught on yet. I totally agree <laughs> with you. Totally agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and next week I'm actually sitting down with Mark Savant, uh, Okay. And he's a big proponent of AI. Like he loves AI and he's pushing well, yeah, it. Yeah. I like it too. I think it's, yeah, it's right. Cool. But it's like yeah. all he does. Just, so, you know, I'm just, I, I want to talk to him about this. I want to see what he says. I want to, you know, and uh, get his point of view also uh, mm -hmm. on the same thing. I would love to get you guys both on the same show. You know, have you guys both guests on the, on the episode. I'm game. I'm game. Just awesome. let, let me know. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be there if I can. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, Rob, uh, we've reached the end of the episode where I like to, call, and we're going to get into a little segment I like to call the final surge where I ask you three questions, uh, personal questions, and uh, you answer them to the best of your ability. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, how do you like your coffee? I put uh, some, uh, not creamer, but it's like, probiotic, uh, kind of like collagen, 
powder in my coffee, and then I add some some stevia, which is a, um, okay, you know, a little bit of a sweetener. Sure, uh, and, and I add some. It's called MCT oil. I don't know if you're familiar. It, it, it it's like a coconut oil to it. Oh so, wow, that yeah. must taste really good. It is. I gotta it try is. that. I, <laughs> I got to try that. Are, uh, are you binging anything right now on streaming platforms? Are you watching anything? Yeah, I watch a lot of, of YouTube content. So I, I, I watch a lot here. I would say more recently about our e- economic situation okay. um, and, and what's going on there around the stock market, around real estate, around politics. what's happening with the economy. Yeah, I mean, I mean a Politics is definitely part of it now. So yeah, I spend quite a bit of time doing that. I'm trying to forecast, have some idea in, in my mind um, what we're going to see happen over the next six months, you know, with rates yeah. and with what's going to happen with the presidential election and how that's going to impact, you know, the culture and society and where that's all going is a little bit uh, up in the air right now. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm just hoping for the price of food to go down. Yeah. <laughs> I think all, all of us would like that to happen, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and finally, what book are you currently reading? I actually read most online. I don't really read that many physical books. So I've, okay. I've always had this perception that they're a little behind the times. Um, but but okay. then on the other hand, it's just taking taking time out to actually do it is the thing. I've got books behind me on my bookshelf behind me. Yeah. Um, from, you know, that were written by my friends. Um, and I'm actually thinking about writing a book myself. So maybe that, that'll, you know, I need to write one of my own before I'll be all, all into books. <laughs> you totally should. You totally should. Yeah. God, that, that is one book I, I would definitely buy. I have a, I have a pile of books behind me here on the table, um, that you can't really see in the shot, but, um, you know, and it's all like podcasting books. It's all, I'm the same way. Like I've yeah. got the Business. first yeah. first podcast book to ever be printed behind me. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. And then, and then a guy a guy I know, uh, Roberto Blake. Yep. He wrote a book on. Yeah, yeah. He gave me a couple of copies of the last time I saw him about the creator economy and stuff like that. Yeah, I love so, Roberto Blake. Yeah, I'm yep. I'm a big fan of uh, Dan Martell. You, you ever hear of him? I think I have heard of him before. Yeah. yeah, he he wrote a book called Buy Back Your Time. You you should definitely pick that up. That's a great ah, okay. that's a great book. And and Larry Roberts, I I know you know that one. Yeah, I do know Larry. Yeah, yeah. I've known him for a long time. Yeah, I got his book on the table there behind me too. So yeah, I should grab uh, this this book and I should uh, I should share it with you. This was written by my co-host of my of my show. The there you go. The new media show up yeah. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wrote the very first book on podcasting. This is oh. it. It's, it's, and it's available on Amazon. I think it might be still available. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, then I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to get it. That's so great. it's, what's interesting about it is, is that if you go back and you look at it, it's, it's almost like a, like a museum of <laughs> right. information. I mean, cause he, he published this in 2005. Yeah. So, so it was right after podcasting started and all the screenshots in it are of all these old browsers, right? Like Windows XP and Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. of all of the the early, yeah, I'm trying to find so, 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 something that would at, at least it's not like, DOS, you know. So, yeah, so you know, <laughs> even got pictures of some early microphones and wow. things like that in it that yeah, so we're, really it's a great book to get but even even back in those days, you know, 2005, the the same microphones like the SM7B and the RE20 and yeah. stuff were were big popular mics back then. Absolutely, these have always been in industry standard, even in radio. You know, so yeah, and then these big big mixers and all this <laughs> right. kind of stuff that were, you know, that I used back in those days too. Or, but people don't use those things as much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, now now it's all smaller, you know, and just yeah. fits on like a little small portion of your desk. And yeah, especially Rode. I mean, their sure. their hardware that they've come out here recently has been is yeah. been pretty amazing. Like that, 
that duo that they have is mm -hmm. that's a that's a remarkable device they have. I, so I just I just picked up the 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 wireless mics, the uh, the Rode Me Twos, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, and I love them. I love them. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> but all right, Rob, uh, why don't you tell everybody where they can uh, get in touch with you and find your show? Yeah, if you just go to Streamyard channels, if you go to um, uh, just uh, YouTube at at Streamyard. Um, you can see my podcast tips with Rob Greenlee program that's live every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And then I do a live show with Todd Cochran called The New Media Show on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Uh, we're not doing it this week, but um, it's been going on for about, I don't know, 13, 14 years now. So we try and do it every week. So, and then I have a website, robgreenlee.com, and I can be reached in email, rob.greenly at gmail.com. If you want to reach out to me, I'd be more than happy to say hi and who knows, right? Whatever comes from that. So, and I'm also on all the social platforms. I've got my own YouTube channel that I have a bunch of different shows that I do over there as well. And then uh, LinkedIn, X at Rob Greenlee and all, all that, all those places. So I can be found. It's not hard to find me. Awesome, Rob. <laughs> like everybody, you you guys, you need to go follow and get in touch with this guy. Like he, he is, uh, he's a trailblazer in the podcasting community. Like you, you just, you need to get in touch with him. Uh, Rob, thank you very much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Good luck to you with your show. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around until the end. Whether you're listening to the podcast on your favorite podcast listening app or watching on YouTube, do us a favor and hit that subscribe button, follow button, plus button, hit whatever button you got to hit to get notified of fresh episodes of Surgecast. I had a blast picking Rob's brain about podcasting. It definitely was enlightening. I hope it helped you guys and inspired you to keep kicking ass. All of Rob's links are down in the show notes. And if you want more out of Surgecast, head over to SurgeMediaNY.com. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time.